here at Beyond Borders, we're all about pushing the boundaries, and you have definitely done that with your book. You brought it uh, to us here. Tell us about it. Well, uh, borders and boundaries are all artificial. I mean, we, we create as a species, we compartmentalize everything. We, we, we make boundaries that don't need to exist. And, and that's, I suppose, easy when we talk about the, about maps. I mean, here it's ironic, I suppose, we're in part of Scotland, it's called the borders. But we do that with education too. We divide our subjects and our curriculum, so we have maths. And that's completely distinct and unrelated to geography, and that's something different to history. Uh, I think what, I've, what, you know, what I'm interested in is, is how, how everything hangs together. And uh, I think that one can look at history that way too, that rather than looking at small periods or small uh, regions, it's more interesting to see how human beings are able to cooperate with each other and how they um, borrow, how they learn, what kind of things bring out the best of our species, you know, which is art and culture and things that we create. But then also to look at the things that bring out humans at their absolute worst, which is warfare and intolerance and suffering, and to try to work out what are the ingredients that, that make us want to try to, um, to gel and to cooperate, and what are the things that make us want to fight and kill each other. And the human history going back over the long term allows you, if you're able to take a wide enough lens, I think, to try to look at uh, how the world has come to be as we are here today in 2016 over the course of many, many centuries, and what kind of themes, what kind of stories come out in that process and to be able to do that to be able to stand back I think you need to be quite honest I think you need to be very brave I think you need to have lots of technical skills languages you need to be above all the, the most important the most important characteristic that any scholar any writer can have is to be humble enough to know that they are trying to cast light into the into the gloom and to try to pick up what they see and and to try to make sense of it and uh, this book that I wrote called The Silk Roads, I think, you know, was a was a very looking back on it now. It's it's been out for a year. It was a very brave attempt to try to look at the world in a very different way, look at the past in a very different kind of way, try to look at peoples and regions that don't get written about, don't get talked about, except when there's a crisis. And you know, some of your other speakers here this weekend are talking about Syria and the Arab Spring or. Uh, the challenges of uh, the United Nations face and what a world without borders looks like. But the starting point for me, for as someone who's involved in education, is to explain how we got to where we start, how, how we got to where we are today. And that story doesn't start in with the invasion of Iraq or the second invasion of Iraq. That doesn't start in 1990. That doesn't start with the Second World War. You need to understand deep history over a longer term to to have enlightenment. But it is very important, uh, the educational point that you're making. It is also about uh, telling uh, uh, kids and uh, most of us that, uh, you know, it's not enough to talk about globalization if we do not understand each other's stories really well and if we do not uh, respect the fact that uh, we come from uh, different backgrounds and different stories. I think that's exactly right. And one could say that about any any region, any part of the world. You know, we. We, we live in a world that is more intensely connected. We're quicker, how we can send emails to each other and so on. But at the same time, um, that's not new. You know, in, in the ancient Roman world, 2000 years of the world of ancient China, ancient Persia, these exchanges were equally intensive. They weren't so fast. You couldn't send a message that someone would receive there and then. But uh, you know, th this globalization is nothing that is new. Our, our desire to find out what is interesting, what is important, what is valuable, what tastes good, what do people wear, how, how do I, how do I um, explain the meaning of life, is something that's preoccupied all of our ancestors. But what's interesting, I think, in the world we live in today, in the 21st century, is that although there are fewer boundaries, you know, digital world has changed how we communicate and how we travel. We can jump on airplanes and get on the other side of the world in eight, nine hours. Uh, we can send emails, we can update each other on social media. Uh, despite the fact that those borders and boundaries are coming down, we communicate less well with each other. Uh, we become more uniform. So everybody has more of the same ideas about uh, Justin Bieber or the Kardashians or whoever it might be. Uh, and in a world where information is more or less free, you can Google anything. You can listen on Spotify for free to anything. No one listens to uh, Persian music. No one listens to what people listen to in the radio in Moscow in the car. You know, in this privileged world of the West where we are tolerant, we've learnt to our cost of what intolerance can do in 
how we persecute each other, we, are, we are, have lost a lot of our curiosity. So in a world where my children grow up where they can switch on their computers and find out anything about anything in the world, they can consult Wikipedia, they, they know the difficulties of trusting it, they, they can listen to any music they like, uh, they can listen, you know, we can download a movie from anywhere in the world, uh, and yet that narrowness of becoming more and more similar seems to be almost tyrannical. And I think the most exciting thing as a, as a, as a scholar is to explore. You know, we all know that as, as, as small children, we all learnt the excitement of walking into a new room, of, of seeing faces we don't recognise. Uh, uh, but that requires us to be brave and it requires us to be inquisitive. And, and those characteristics are, are ones which we don't reward in society. Uh, finally, this going against the tyranny of opinion and, uh, you know, struggling for truth and, and something else that connects us all. One is reminded of uh, uh, the kind of uh, historians that you mentioned before, not only Runciman, but also uh, Eric Hobsbawm and those who would, who would risk uh, uh, their entire lives and careers uh, for truth. Do you see yourself as... Uh, no, I, don't think you, I don't think you risk anything. I think that you, um, you, know, you, you write something that you, that you think is, right, is, is correct. You're not trying to provoke on purpose. You don't say something just to get a reaction or to get headlines. You, you try and say how you see the world. And if you are able to learn lots of languages that opens up different sources, different uh, regions and so on that other people haven't heard about. What's interesting about my book is how many people have wanted to read it, actually. So I think it's, you know, you can, you can be, well, I could be too serious about this idea that, uh, you know, you're being revolutionary. You just give your opinion. And if people, they, it's up to them to decide whether they value it or whether they agree with it or challenge it. But, the, the, you know, all historians are opening a window at their particular moment in time. And we're living in a world right now in the early 21st century where it's obvious to everybody that we're living in a time of change. Change in the Middle East, change with Iran, change in Pakistan and India, change with China, change in Russia, and, and, and change in the West, you know, with, whether it's the European Union or what the West even means, and change, of course, in Sub-Saharan Africa and so on. And I think when you're living through this period where it's clear that history is being made, as commentators talk about it, the first thing you need to do is to study and understand why we have got to where we are. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a real honor to be mentioned in the name of stellar scholars. All, all they've, they, they've tried to do the, exactly the same thing that I've done as, as my contemporaries or my, my peers did a thousand years ago. They would have explained what the world looks like to them and why. One simple lesson, ask the right question. Thanks very much. <laughs>